All right. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, a new methodology Enrico and I have sort of been experimenting with. Um, There's very much a work in progress, though, but I think it's got some very interesting... Um, uh, there's an interesting message here about where perhaps the future of studying movement is headed. Um, so that's the reason why I'm presenting it today. Um, but before I begin, I think I need to tell you guys a little bit about myself. I'm quite a nerd for maps. I had treasure maps as a kid. I was in Boy Scouts. And lately, as I've been reading Game of Thrones, um, I find myself always flipping back to the map, you know, finding out where things are going. Um, funnily enough, though, on my... Can you push play, please, in this is please everybody. Yeah. Push play? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, on my copy, though, I don't know if you guys have this. Somebody has put Dire Wolf Home Ranges um, up in the Winterfell area there. Do you guys just have that one? No. Um, so, anyways, that being said, when I first got involved with Oceans, you know, four, four or so years ago, um, I really needed to see where these animals are going. It was just an obsession of mine. So, I harassed Enrico for some data and just said, you know, give me something to play with. Um, so this is an example of some of that here. I knew there were these tools for home range analysis. That was kind of the talk of the town at the time. Um, so what I did was basically played around with some of these. Um, I think this is a, a sort of reflective of how a lot of us think. You know, the first thing we want to know is what's going on. Where, where are these things happening? Who are they involving? You know, those five essential questions. Um, I also think it's sort of reflective of how we progress through scientific research. We start just simple descriptions, where and when, and then we kind of move on to more hypothesis testing. Um, so anyways, I've got these two uh, classical sort of home range analysis techniques here. Um, this is the minimum complex polygon, and it's essentially just the smallest shape, smallest convex shape that includes all of the fixes. This is the 95%, so we exclude some outliers here. The other one is the kernel density estimate. Um, and they both kind of have their pluses and their, their pros and their cons, their limitations. I actually learned quite a bit about the assumptions and the limitations of these, just kind of teaching myself, getting interested in where these sharks were going. Um, minimum convex polygon, you can see has the possibility, the potential to include a lot of area that might not necessarily be in the home range. Uh, or, you know, it, it really doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on within these areas. Kernel density is more of a probability function. So it gives us a little more information about where these sort of intensive uh, usage areas are. But it's very uh, sensitive to the sampling design. So if we are sampling infrequently, you can miss migration corridors, movement corridors between sites, and those are very important parts of an animal's activity usage or home range. Um, yeah, so I, we can take a look here at the actual definition of home range, the biological definition. This is from 1943. That area traversed by the individual in its normal activities of food gathering, mating, and caring for young. Occasional sallies outside the area, perhaps exploratory in nature, should not be considered part of the home range. You guys can read. Um, I mention this though because it's a very, it makes sense lot, uh, when you think about it as a definition, but it's hard to apply this um, sort of quantitatively. We don't have any mention of time here. Over what durations are we talking about? Is this a day? Is it a month? Is it a lifetime? Um, and I say this because the duration that we're sampling has a very large impact on what we would then observe as home range using these classical techniques convex polygons and kernel density estimates. Uh, these two graphs here represent the area, um, the increase in area as we sample of two white sharks, 2.2 meter female and a 4.2 meter female tract here in Muscle Bay. And these are actually the two longest recorded active tracks of a white shark. This is 106 consecutive hours and this one is 107. So in this first individual here, we see this asymptote here after about 30 or so hours. That's generally what you look for to establish that you have sampled enough, that you can say that it's animal's home range. Um, but here in this other individual, 107 hours, we don't really get an asymptote. We may, might have a small flattening plateau there, but we're sort of increasing almost all along the way. Um, so there's this question of whether or not we actually did achieve its home range. We can't really say that we've got it here. 
Uh, we can look also perhaps for a month sampling duration. This is a shark, the shark formerly known as Orion's Hope. I think its name has been changed since. Um, but this is the last couple weeks in March and the first week or so of April, and it's spent a lot of time in this area. So if we did a home range analysis on this using our classical techniques, we might say that this is more representative of um, a home range. We've got a longer sampling duration. Um, but Enrico, if you could push play again. The past couple weeks, this animal has all of a sudden moved over to this bay, and we would have missed all of that. Um, so the message here is that these techniques, they're, they're quite um, limited in really what they can say about a home range, unless we're sampling for biologically meaningful durations. Um, whether that's a month or a year, we don't really know. It's been suggested that white sharks have this two-year migration cycle. So with acoustic tracking, that's pretty much out of the question. Um, and until Osage came along, satellite tags also were out of many of our budgets. Um, but fortunately, all, all isn't really lost. There is a lot of value to these classical techniques. Um, they're just perhaps more suited to analysis of activity spaces, not necessarily home range, but core usage areas. Um, traditionally, what's done is you take this 50% isopleth. It's hard to see here, but uh, the first kernel density I showed was the 95% probability density. This is the 50%. So these are more intensively used areas. Here in Mosul Bay, we've got one around Seal Island, then uh, in between Seal Island and the Hart and Mosul River mouth, Glanbrook, and then up at Krutbrook. Um, and these, we think, are sort of these core usage areas. And they do reflect what we know about the bay. Seal Island is an obvious foraging ground. And then there's a lot of reef structures, estuary environments in the river mouths. Uh, so there is some information to be gathered here, but we're really limited in drawing conclusions from purely location-based information. Um, these are sort of just arbitrary probability cutoffs without any real biological uh, justification. Um, so what ultimately we need is a little bit more information here to figure out what's going on in these, uh, in these areas, answer these process-based questions about, you know, What's going on? Why is it going on? How is it going on? Um, that, I'm going to mention in a bit, I think is really where we're headed now with this movement research. Um, but tools, devices like accelerometers, I'll talk about these um, in my next presentation, they reveal, they have the potential to reveal a lot more about how these animals are using these areas. Um, but for this little experiment that we're doing, just the simple addition of time as a parameter, the time between each relocation, will reveal a lot more about what's going on. Um, you can just play a quick little demonstration here. Uh, we just have a simple track and you can see how it moves along the bay. That's all, pretty much. <laughs> all right, uh, so kind of in this little, um, my, my self-taught um, little foray into animal movement analysis, um, I learned quite a bit. The first one was that we need a little bit more information to, to really go beyond just describing what these animals are doing. Um, things like accelerometers again, shameless plug, and the addition of time. That will take us, take us a lot further. The other thing I realized is that a lot of these tools are getting quite old. Um, this one is the, probably the most popular tool used for performing those classical minimum convex polygons and kernel densities. This is animal movement analysis and it's in um, it's used in ArcView 3.2 but you know 1999 doesn't sound so long ago but it's 15 years old now this is quite old um, I was actually very happy to see Ollie I think is going to talk about these movement based kernel density estimates and you don't do those in this software so I think he's kind of covering those last two bases the addition of additional information and using these newer tools I'm very happy to see that um, but I also realized a third thing, and that kind of reflects what Allison was saying the other day. I was sort of going about this without any clear um, research questions or research goals. I was just sort of experimenting, playing around with data. And there's some value to that, in that exploratory sort of um, exploratory driven <laughs> analysis. But I wasn't actually testing any hypotheses. So I took a step back. Um, I went back to Enrico, who kind of, and this time had become a bit of a mentor to me, and I said, Enrico, look, I know there's these tools out here, these better tools. I know they exist. Um, I want to use them. I want to step up to the plate, join the big leagues, but I don't really know where to start. Like, 
you know, what are you looking at? What do you have for me? And he said, eh, well, <laughs> why do you want to go over here? <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, he said, uh, well, as part of my PhD, I'm looking at the rate of movement um, between a lot of these sites, the tracking, uh, the rate of movement as we've been tracking. And he thought maybe that there was some way to split these tracks up based on the rate of movement. Look at different, perhaps different behaviors corresponded to different speeds. Um, so that's where we kind of started with this. Uh, we, we aim to define the behavioral patterns of these white sharks based on just the spatial and temporal data. So we've got their position, now we're looking at time between each of these positions. And the key question we're looking at is, is rate of movement, ROM, um, independent of location? And here we're using rate of movement sort of as a proxy for the speed of the animal. Um, our study site here in Mossel Bay, Seal Island is in this area, we are now right about down here. Um, and it's a protected bay from the north and the west, it's very easy to track here. We've got most of the year very nice conditions and um, we've got all the equipment for acoustic tracking set up here. The, the sharks that I use just for this analysis, there are six, six white sharks, um, most of them in sort of that three meter range, all female and the tracking durations here. These are not all consecutive, they're some of them cumulative efforts. Um, but that's just the individuals we used. Uh, so what we did, um, I think most of us that are tracking do the same protocol where you sort of take a position when you reach a certain threshold in signal strength from the VR100 if you're using BEMCO equipment. Uh, so we did that, we took a position roughly every 10 minutes. Um, and then from there, calculated the rate of movement between the sites. And this is just the horizontal rate of movement, the speed over ground. Um, we've got a distribution of the, of the density of these rates. And here we're talking about total length per second. So it's been standardized for the individual variation in length, or the variation among our um, sample size in length here. And we kind of see there's this one mode up here, and then there might be the second mode at a slower rate of movement. So there's um, definitely some underlying distribution of, um, of rates here that are building up what, we're, what we see. Um, so what I did was in R I found a tool um, called MCLUST, and it's very well referenced in the literature. And what it does is identifies the parameters of the mixture of models that might compose the distribution that we observe. Um, so we can sort of visualize that here. Uh, the model uses the, uh, the method uses uh, an expectation maximization algorithm. And then um, that's how it develops the parameters of the model, the, the means and the standard deviations of the component normal distributions. Um, and then uses one of the prohibitive or the, the penalized information criterions to decide how many of those distributions comprise our observed distribution. So we've got here five sort of underlying models in our observed distribution. Um, the first one, the mean is centered about 0.03 total lengths per second, and then we get all the way up here. There's very few, but some of these faster ones in this range. And then the black line is the estimated density if you were to sum all of these distributions. So you can sort of do what we normally use to test for normality, the QQ plot, and look at our observed sample quantiles against our estimated quantiles from density, and they match up fairly well. You get a straight line here. Um, so it's feasible that this underlying component distribution actually built up what we observed. We might have you know, some, some useful clusters here. And we can, we can look at this on a map, too. Uh, these are the different models observed spatially. And you see a lot of this offshore movement here is represented or defined by this the blue model, this 0.338 total lengths per second. Then you get some inshore movements with the green, and then these cluster, they're, uh, they're underneath the map, but you get these um, aggregation you know, at the foraging sites, these red ones here. So we can, we can then look at these individually. I think there's a, some interesting things to be gathered. Um, this is the fastest model, model 5. 0.8 or so total lengths per second. There weren't many of the uh, many examples to draw from. It, it identified only one, two, three, four, five, six instances where the sharks were traveling this fast. Um, but I, I was curious because we sort of we see them in the areas of um, these foraging sites. But when we 
we, when we record the rate of movement, we're averaging over about 10, uh, 10 minutes or so in some cases. So we're, you know, we're not getting quick burst events for breaching, that sort of thing. So I don't, I don't think that's exactly what was going on. Um, so I went and looked back at the sharks that did make up these, um, this model, and it was the three smallest sharks, the 1.7, the 2.2, and I think it was a 2.7 shark. Um, so perhaps what's going on here, we are at, at known aggregation or uh, you know, foraging grounds. Maybe there's some kind of hierarchical avoidance where they're being pushed away and fleeing um, some of their larger conspecifics. Just, just an idea, not really quantifiable yet. Um, but this again is just early stages. Um, the next model here is a bit slower, 0.338 total lengths per <coughs> second. Um, this though I think is more representative of just the normal cruising speed of the animal. The interesting thing though is that the movement in this model is mostly sort of uh, longitudinal, this east and west movement. Um, if I go back you can see this again. These are the blue ones here. Um, you see a lot of it is sort of offshore, uh, offshore movement. Compare that to this one which is uh, still sort of a mid-range speed but it's more latitudinal, up and down. So this might be perhaps navigational movement. Um, so we're starting to maybe actually identify the, some of the behaviors based on the speed that they're traveling. I think it's really cool. Um, the last couple here, sort of, we start to see some of the, uh, the same things that we saw in those core usage from the 50% kernel density. We've starting to identify some of these actual aggregation sites. Um, the, this speed could be representative of you know, arrival at those sites and identifying them as those locations and then what happens next is they slow down and they start to exploit them. Um, it's, um, it's been proposed that as animals encounter these foraging sites they sort of slow down to maximize the time spent in these areas. Um, but I think also what might be uh, an interesting next step, I just thought of this the other day, um, we're looking at the horizontal rate of movement here, taking the position of the boat as representative of the position of the shark. Um, and there's been recent theories, I know for tiger sharks they've proposed that there's this sort of yo-yo diving behavior to encounter more prey. Um, we've got the depth data here. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to see if, you know, maybe that's why we're, we're getting these slow speeds at the areas because it's not so much horizontal movement, it's this up and down movement to encounter some of these uh, prey items going on here. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at with this idea. It's just something we've been working on in the past few days, but I wanted to share it firstly because it's sort of an interesting way to, um, rather than just using pure statistics, it sort of incorporates this biological element to those statistical tools. We've got biologically meaningful core usage areas, not just arbitrary probability cutoffs. Um, the second reason I wanted to explain this or share this was because everything I did was done with free open source software. It was all done in R. Um, there's also free GIS software called QGIS, Quantum GIS. So if um, the reason people were using maybe these older tools was the prohibitive costs of Arc 10, you know, there's free stuff out there and it's very powerful. It's constantly developed. So I want to encourage everybody to look into these options. I challenge anybody to say, Find something that cannot be done in R, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that thing can do everything. Um, but this, this I think, is the, the real strength of this subject here. Um, this sort of borrowing of analytical features from different disciplines. Um, things like statistical physics, where people are looking at the foraging strategies and relating them to particle levy flight, tech, uh, levy flight hypotheses. Um, a lot of the clustering stuff comes from bioinformatics. And I think the way we're going to identify these novel tools is by these collaborative efforts where we're working, combining movement, um, people studying movement with geneticists. It'll encourage that, you know, the bigger picture idea, but it'll also give us these more clever tools, way to look at things. I think that's going to be um, sort of what drives the future of these movement studies. Um, but also, being able to sort of test these hypotheses is going to push us from just simple descriptive studies of where things are happening, when things are happening, to this process based off what and why. Um, oh, thanks, there you go. <coughs> Jumps 
start, yeah, jump start this transition. I think we're actually seeing that. Yesterday we saw a lot of interesting use of models um, to describe these movements. We're not just showing where they go anymore. And then it looks like today we've got a lot of new interesting techniques for studying these things. Accelerometers, brubs, these kernel, uh, new movement-based kernel density estimates. Um, I just want to end here with a quote. This, I think, is from the, the new edition of Biology of Sharks and Rays. Um, it's from David Sims, who is, in my opinion, the shark movement expert of our generation. And he says, you know, for the future of all shark research, not just movement research, um, this of central importance will be the clear identification and testing of behavioral ecological hypotheses, combining advanced movement analysis with simulations and modeling to better understand habitat preferences through space and time, and hence elucidate redistribution patterns. So I think, you know, the scientific progression, you start with these descriptions, and then we start testing hypotheses, multidisciplinary synthesis. I think we're right on the cusp of that, and it's actually quite an interesting time to be here um, and amongst it all. So that's uh, what I wanted to first talk about today. The next one I'm in a couple, another couple hours, I guess. Any questions?